Welcome to episode four of the MJ Reynolds podcast. I can't believe I've done four already. Um, so today I have a very special guest, a very good friend of mine. He's an author. He's a YouTuber, although I'm not sure how, uh, how much he'll like me describing him as such. <laughs> and he's a, a, a podcaster as well. And I've known him a long time. And his name is David Green. David, thank you very much for joining me today. Hello, thanks for having uh, me on. Uh, very happy to be here. Yeah, your first TikTok live. As you just my first me. TikTok live, yeah. I've had TikTok yeah. for a while because um, my publisher insists that I have it, and it is good for selling books. Um, there's like a lot of uh, vibrant book things on it, but I am very uncomfortable with all of it. <laughs> <laughs> book talk, as they call it. Yeah, right. Book talk. So today we're uh, it's the big one today. It's the Fab Four. We're going to talk about the Beatles. Uh, so we're going to do the usual. We're going to talk a little bit about how Dave and I know each other. And then a little bit about our history with the Beatles as well. So I reckon we've now known each other almost 10 years, maybe more. Yeah, I was, yeah I was thinking about that um, just today, actually, when I was driving my son to school. I was like, how long have I known Matt for? And um, yeah, I think it's probably more than 10 years now. I think it's probably 11, maybe 12 years, I think. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about how we, how we met? Because it's quite unorthodox, really, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty nerdy, really, isn't it, as well? It is. <laughs> right. uh, so we uh, were both, I still are, I suppose, but my, my game, video game playing isn't as a, isn't as big as it used to be um, mm. for various reasons. But we were both big uh, gamers, particularly Xbox ones, and we were both fans and readers of a magazine called Xbox World 360, which is the weirdest name of all time, really. It's like, how many things can we throw in here, like, uh, as a title? Um <laughs> And the, and the, so for whatever reason, uh, not only did we read the magazine, we ended up being super nerds and we joined the Facebook page and we would kind of talk to them all there. And it was quite active because the, the writers would go on there and talk and everything. But then we just kept on like commenting on the same stuff all the time and chatting and uh, just got to know each other that way. Um, and then I started a Xbox World started closing down. They announced they were closing down. Um so I, we were talking and we're like, oh, why don't we start like a, a website and try and do the same thing with a podcast and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we'll do it, you know, try and get the same kind of people from this community over. And um, that, that's what we did. Uh, and uh, But we were probably talking every day at that point. We had like a few different group chats that other people kind of dropped in and out of as yeah. they still do to this day. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. But uh, <laughs> we, we've been constant, constantly there for the last 12 years or so, 11 years. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. We've, we've obviously met each other up in, in real life. Because uh, the, the, the weirdest thing is, is obviously I, I have an English accent. I, I lived in England, but we probably met each other just after I left England and moved to Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so like from the majority of well, the whole time that we've known each other, we've lived in different countries. Um, so, uh, but we have met each other quite a few times now in real yeah. life. Do lots of podcasts. Do lots of during the pandemic, we did lots of uh, Zoom calls, just hanging out, having a drink, and stuff like that. A few uh, kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I I think of you as one of my very best friends. Yeah, oh, the feelings mutual. So I think the first time I met you was your stag do. Like the first time I met you in person was, yeah. in York. Yeah. That was it. That was it. That was, it was yeah. That was good. That was uh, my dad. My my dad was there, which is uh, we, we he was. Talk yeah. about that. It's <laughs> one of your fav- I think it's one of your favourite memories of is uh, is my dad yeah. at that at that thing. Um, yeah, it was good. It yeah, was good. I, yeah. I had I had two stags because I had I obviously, obviously had friends in England, I had friends in Ireland, and I was like. I don't want to have to make people fly over and all that kind of stuff and, and all that nonsense. So I was like, you know what? I was going to have two. I'm only married once, probably. Who knows? Um, <laughs> and still, who knows uh, if that is the case. Um, but uh, I was like, you know, yeah, I'll have two stag. Why not? It's my stag. I can cry if I want to. But it was my dad who cried. <laughs> so, yeah, there's our, our history together. Yeah, we've known each other for a long time now. Um, as an aside, another member of our low fat gaming as it was called our podcast and website was sam drower who was my guest last week talking about death tones so uh dave and sam know each other as well um and yeah we we just had a great time with it uh we met loads of brilliant people as dave said some some are still friends to this day some maybe not 
Uh, we were published quite a bit in the magazine as well, weren't we? We were always like sending in yeah. little, little nerdy opinions on things. <laughs> so, yeah, it was little, good. Little nerdy things, yeah. <laughs> we were both on the front cover of our, our names were on the front cover of the yeah. final issue as well, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 I didn't never kept so. that. I wish I had now, but yeah, I know I lost it. <laughs> oh well. Right. So yeah. I suppose we better better talk about the Beatles then, the big one. So this may end up. I don't know. We'll see how it goes today. Um, it, with the Beatles, there's such a legacy. There's so many good songs. So. We may end up doing two parts to this podcast. Um, whether or not that means I split this one in two or whether Dave comes back at some point, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, as usual, I'm just going to read out a biography, um, just some random shit that I've pulled off Wikipedia. So <laughs> hopefully it's accurate. Who knows? <laughs> but again, it's the Beatles. So this is a fairly long one. Um, my printer wasn't working today, so I'm going to read this off my other phone, my burner phone that I use for my illicit business. Uh, right, so... The Beatles were an English rock band formed in Liverpool in 1960 that comprised John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr. They are regarded as the most influential band of all time and were integral to the development of 1960s counterculture and popular music's recognition as an art form. Rooted in skiffle, beat and 1950s rock and roll, their sound incorporated elements of classical music and traditional pop in innovative ways. The band later explored musical styles ranging from ballads and Indian music to psychedelia and hard rock. As pioneers in recording, songwriting and artistic presentation, the Beatles revolutionised many aspects of the music industry and were often publicised as leaders of the era's youth and socio-cultural movements. There we go. I was doing so well. <laughs> Led by primary songwriters Lennon and McCartney, the Beatles evolved from Lennon's previous group, the Quarrymen, and built their reputation playing clubs in Liverpool and Hamburg over three years from 1960 initially with Stuart Sutcliffe playing bass. The core trio of Lennon, McCartney and Harrison, together since 1958, went through a succession of drummers, including Pete Best, before asking Starr to join them in 1962. Manager Brian Epstein moulded them into a professional act, and producer George Martin guided and developed their recordings, greatly expanding their domestic success after their first hit, Love Me Do, in late 1962. As their popularity grew into the intense fan frenzy dubbed Beatlemania, the band acquired the nickname The Fab Four, with Epstein, Martin and other members of the band's entourage sometimes given the informal title of Fifth Beatle. By early 1964, the Beatles were international stars and had achieved unprecedented levels of critical and commercial success. They became a leading force in Britain's cultural resurgence, ushering in the British invasion of the United States pop market, and soon made their film debut with A Hard Day's Night in 1964. From 1965 onwards, they produced records of greater sophistication, including the albums Rubber Soul, Revolver, Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and enjoyed further commercial success with The Beatles, also known as The White Album, and Abbey Road. Heralding the album era, their success elevated the album to be the dominant form of record consumption over singles. They also inspired a greater public interest in psychedelic drugs and Eastern spirituality, and furthered advancements in electronic music, album art and music videos. In 1968, they founded Apple Corps, a multi-armed multimedia corporation that continues to oversee projects related to the band's legacy. After the group's breakup in 1970, all principal members enjoyed success as solo artists and some partial reunions have occurred. Lennon was murdered in 1980 and Harrison died of lung cancer in 2001. McCartney and Starr remain musically active. The Beatles are the best-selling music act of all time with estimated sales of 600 million units worldwide. So there we go. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about with the Beatles. So um, we're going to go into your history with the band first. So with this, I'm assuming it will be a childhood thing, but we'll soon find out. Take it yeah, away. Um, yeah, uh, it's interesting that, that bio that you, that you read there as well, because you, you often get, we have to kind of talk about the uh, elephant in the room with the Beatles, whereas it's cool for some people to say that they're no good and they're, and they're not as, and they're overrated. But I think um, yeah. a lot of the stuff that you went on there is like, you know, you know, you can not like the music, and that's that's fine. It's, it's subjective, but their influence that they've had and how they changed music was is you know it, it can't be it can't be denied because no. one of the things that you said there about how they the album became more popular when the Beatles came around, people just released singles. The albums was a thing that had single that had the singles on it and then covers of other people's work, and uh, the Beatles when they first started were very adamant that they wanted the majority of their stuff to be their own their own work. So even the first album had, I think it was nine songs from fourteen that were that were original, which was unheard of. And a hard day's night 
um, which was a movie soundtrack essentially for the movie that they did, was yeah. the first popular record to have completely material, new material on it, um, which is you know 1964. It, it changed everything. Um, so and then all the kind of recording stuff that he did as well, which was completely new and different, which people have copied for years and years and years. But um, my kind of history with them, it, it's funny, it wasn't actually the music that, that came into it. It was actually the movies. It was A Hard Day's Night and Help. Uh, uh, yeah. But that kind of got me into it. So I, uh, my granddad uh, and my mum, my dad hates the Beatles, but he hates everything uh, except for <laughs> crying at stag do's. <laughs> uh, but like, um, so my granddad uh, was a big, big fan of uh charlie chaplin um abbott and costello markman wise uh carry on movies which is surprising because uh he's um he's irish so you, you know you wouldn't think carry on would, was that kind of sense but he loved all that kind of stuff right and he loved the beatles movies he, he didn't like the music because he liked all kind of country and western and swing and all that kind of stuff because like you know he was born in the 1920s right so he was like the Beatles was like a little bit when they came out was probably a bit too much for him but he loved the movies because he thought they were funny uh so he would watch them when they're on tv and um my mum liked the Beatles she liked the music and they were just on I was I was at my granddad's house one night and there was a it must have been some kind of anniversary or something of of something that happened it was in the 80s or maybe the late the early 90s or something it was probably 1990 it was probably 10 years since john lennon's death or something like that right and they had like there was a beatles night on i think it was bbc2 and uh they had like a lot of like documentaries about them and everything like that and but they also were showing a hard day's night and help so uh i was at my granddad's house my mum was there and my brother was there i think and they let us stay up late to watch these movies um and I think I probably heard some of the music at that point, but I wasn't really kind of like into it or anything. I was only a kid, like I was really, really young. And, um, but I watched these movies and I thought they were hilarious, right? I thought they were just so good. And like, I thought that, I thought they were proper actors and everything. I was like, these guys, why, why have they not been in anything else? Why have I not seen them in Star Wars or something, right? <laughs> it's kind of stuff. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then like, you know, kind of, nodding along to the music and wanting to watch the movies again and like kind of singing the songs and remembering because obviously the, the songs at that time were very very catchy and you know Hard Day's Night and Help and all that kind of stuff and some of my favourite Beatles songs were actually off of Hard Day's Night which I think is one of the best albums and it's probably the best album of that period as well um, so I just got in from that way my mum would play me the, the records um, and yeah since then they were just like always been like kind of part of my life in terms of like listening to music and influential on my own when I used to be in bands and stuff I was big kind of like you know you know into that kind of music as well and uh yeah and even still the film I still think that both the films are, are, are brilliant those two films uh the other films aren't quite as good that it did but um Hard Day's Night and Help are still really great British comedy films yeah yeah okay there we go right so my history is a little bit different um, I think my earliest memory of the Beatles is actually sitting in school assembly when I was very, very little in primary school and hearing uh, they made us sing songs. A lot of the time it would be um, kind of hymns and, you know, religious stuff as it, as it was back in the day. I don't know if it still is, actually. I'm not sure. Um, but in between that, they'd intersperse it with kind of these famous old pop songs and we'd all have to sit there as kids and you'd have the, the little old lady on the creaky piano in the corner of the assembly right. hall just you know playing playing bad versions of these songs and uh, yeah. the first one I ever heard was When I'm 64 um, right, I'm yeah, assuming yeah. just because it's a bit of a jaunty kind of almost almost novelty song isn't it really and so I think they thought that'd be a good one for us all us kiddies to sing um, and I just yeah so that's I, I don't really have any feelings one way or another on that song in particular but um <laughs> Yeah, that, that's my very earliest memory of the Beatles. But growing up, um, as I've mentioned on other casts, I mean, my whole family's musical, both my parents are musicians. Um, and so there was always LPs on in the house. Um, but also we always had these amazing like mixtapes when we went on holiday, just on cassette in the car. And I have a feeling throughout as many episodes as I do of this podcast, this, this is going to come up a lot with a lot of the bands, my earliest memories of them. Um, so it was listening to a cassette of loads of different acts. It had everything from like David Bowie, 
Guns N' Roses, The Police, just all these amazing bands, and then The Beatles as well. Um, and I think the earliest one from that I can remember on one of those tapes was probably Penny Lane, which is... I, I forget, uh, Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember you saying in a previous conversation you're not crazy about that song. Is that right? Yeah. Um, it was kind of... It's, it's actually a period of The Beatles kind of discography that I'm not the hottest on it's not i don't yeah. like it or anything but i think it's um it was a little bit at a time when they were kind of switching from the psychedelia kind of era back to more progressed prog rock i suppose which they ended yeah, their careers yeah. with and it's um there's a few songs of that era that i'm kind of a little bit cold on in general yeah. no, that's fair yeah. enough but yeah no it's um it remains one of my favorite beatles songs to this day um just because it's, the melody of it is it's just so happy and i know that's a weird thing yeah. like to say but yeah it just it brings back really good memories of my dad especially it, it reminds me of my dad that song a lot and um right. and just going on these long car journeys to various places um across the uk we used to go we had a big camper van because uh, my dad won the pools back when i was a kid and so he won about 10 right. grand i think and bought a <laughs> bought a camper van nice. with it, like a massive one and we just used to go around from you know anywhere from Land's End to all the way up to Scotland, and and so had plenty of time to listen to all this stuff in the car, and so yeah. that was really my first time hearing all this music. I mean, I wasn't into music like I until I was a teenager, probably sixteen or seventeen was when I really got into it and started wanting to do it as a career, which is obviously what I do now. Right. But um, yeah, but even as early as back then, like when you know I was about eight, nine, ten, it was all kind of bleeding into me via osmosis, you know, just like subconsciously right, yeah, yeah. all this all this amazing music and so yeah it remains one of my favorites um i did play that when we were doing i was doing some lockdown gigs online trying to you know get some some yeah. paypal donations of people when we had that hard <laughs> yes. time a couple of years back um and i learned penny lane for one of them i learned a few beatles songs and my god there are so many chords in that song like i'm i'm used to the covers gigs i do it's just like i like to learn three or four chord songs that just repeat because then i can drink and I don't forget right. them when I'm right, on stage. Right, right. So yeah, yeah, but that was that was really great because it had about twenty different chords in it. It's just a very unique song with chord progressions in it. I love the melodies. I love the um, the brass section that comes in, the penny whistle at the end, um, and again, very um, strong imagery, which I think is going to be a theme throughout this podcast. Certainly for me, um, it's yeah. one of the first first times I remember listening to lyrics, like actually paying attention to lyrics in a song and thinking, "Wow, this is like telling a story," but at the same time, it's it's very random, you know, and say it simultaneously. Right. So, yeah. Right, yeah. So yeah. I think um, I think it's time to play a song. I'm going to play that one, and then next we'll talk a bit more, and then play one of your picks. We're going to do more picks. It's worth saying for anyone who's been tuning in regularly to the podcast. I normally get my guests to do three or four, but like I said, there are hundreds of Beatles songs, and there are so many good ones to choose from. So we're going to do about eight each, I think. So again, we'll see if we split it up. But for now, this is Penny Lane. You've just heard Penny Lane by the Beatles. Uh, with me today, if you're just joining me, is David Green. And you were about to say, I believe, something about this song? Yeah, I've been to Penny Lane. It's funny how you mentioned um, about how you do these kind of songs in, in school, like hymns and stuff. We It was the same. Obviously, we were at school at the same time. We were probably in, yeah. we were probably in the same year, actually. Obviously, different I think we parts of the country. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had a music teacher that would always do... Uh, Obla Dee, Obla Da, which is like a, a fascinating song to tell. That's the song that actually started the breakup of the Beatles. That one. If you look at the history of how they recorded it, it was the most fractitious time. Like those walkouts, arguments, the the real meat of the arguments was around that time of this song, right? Uh, but we used to sing it all the time in music. We used to learn it on piano and everything like that. And um, and uh, when I'm 64 as well was was another one that we would regularly do in music. But this music teacher used to take us. We was obviously in, in a out school in Warrington, which is in between Manchester and Liverpool. So he would take us out on the bus, and we'd he'd go to like this is Penny Lane. This is where the Beatles wrote Penny Lane, and oh, this is what it's about. And he'd take us to other parts of Liverpool, and we'd do like little Beatles tours and everything like that. It was it was really good. That's cool, man. Right. Um... So I think, is there anything else you want to talk about about your history with them before we move on to other like favorite songs and things? Um, I, I guess really that the thing was for me with the Beatles is that they were so formative that it's where it's it's kind of like the baseline for me in terms of where I go forwards and backwards with music. Um, and, and with that is that I like a lot of music 
that come that came before the Beatles that the Beatles were inspired by like Buddy Holly, which is he's one of my favorites. I, I I'll listen to at least one Buddy Holly song a day, really. Like I listen to music all the time, and, and for someone who wasn't active for all that long, he has such a great legacy. But that came from the Beatles. I I, I wasn't into Buddy Holly before the Beatles. I, I got into him because of it, and then backwards into like more blues music like you know Robert Johnson and, and all this kind of stuff and then forwards from that like Led Zeppelin my, my love of Led mm. Zeppelin uh, came from the Beatles because I got into Led Zeppelin because um, I was researching the Beatles and I'd read a comment from George Harrison saying that he liked Led Zeppelin but why did they never do any ballads so they wrote uh, the Rain song Yes, yeah. which is one of the greatest ballads of all time, and so I got into Led Zeppelin because of that. So they've always, so the Beatles have always been that kind of like baseline for me, where everything else has kind of progressed from forwards and backwards. So um, it's really, it's really hard to escape them, I suppose, for for a lot of people. It is, yeah, and um, I have noticed a bit, of kind of what you were saying at the beginning. Um, these days, more of I wouldn't even call it a backlash, really, because you know it, they're still considered, you know, one of, if not the greatest bands of all time, but. I personally know quite a few people who cannot stand them, like absolutely cannot stand mm. them. And I think a lot of, um, you know, younger people growing up today, it's not necessarily that they don't like them, but there's such a disconnect for them in the world that we live in now. And then the world that the Beatles lived in and made their music in. Yeah. And their music is timeless, but I, I think certainly for me as well, and I, you know, I grew up, obviously, you know, the Beatles were around a lot, you know, longer before either of us were kind of born or doing anything to do with music or the arts really but um you know we were closer certainly closer to it than today's generations are but um it yeah. still took me till I was an adult to fully appreciate the Beatles I've always liked them as I said since I was a kid listening to these songs but mm. um when you view them through the lens of an adult with adult experiences and especially certain songs it just um it makes so much sense and it's really shocking. Like I, I wouldn't say I listen to the Beatles on the regular, to be honest. Um, but when I do, I just suddenly remember how incredible they are and how much I love them. It's like this week, brushing up for this podcast, I've been listening to you know loads of Beatles, and I just thought like, well, every time I'm like, my God, why have I not listened to them for so long? It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you you, I, I, you get used to a certain type of music, especially today's music, which is very reductive. I'm not saying it's not good, but it's very reductive in terms of modern popular music tends to be a four chord sequence repeated for three minutes. And right. while there are certain elements of that in the Beatles back catalogue, they were so sophisticated and mm -hmm. you, you listen to it now and you're like, this still doesn't sound like anything else. Yeah. And it's, it's funny as well, because you think about, um, they're, they're very much trend. They were very much trendsetters all the time. And the thing that kind of, speaks to me more than that or anything is if you follow the Rolling Stones, everything the Rolling Stones started doing was a couple of years after the Beatles did it, right? And it's, yeah, you, can, yeah. you can see the chart, it's almost next to each other and that's something John, John Lennon spoke of quite a lot. And funnily enough, the, the first Rolling Stones number one was was written by Lennon and McCartney in a pub. They went, they went yeah. and met the Rolling Stones, they had the same manager and they were like, and the manager was like, will you write them a song to get to, because we need a number one hit. So they just went off in the corner of a pub, knocked out this song, brought it over to them. They recorded it later on that day and it went to number one. And that's what inspired um, uh, Jagger and Richards to start writing their own stuff because they're like, this this is easy. If they can do it, why can't we, right? But you can yeah. see that. But the, the thing that kind of speaks to me the most of it is like, if you listen to um, particularly the stuff that's on, uh, Abbey Road and, and Let It Be Naked because Let It Be Naked you can hear it a lot better that stuff was all recorded at the end of the 60s but it's really the sound of the 70s there's so many bands of the early 70s that sound like those albums that went on for the yeah. next five years right and um, yeah they were they're, they're quite special in, in that kind of way um, but uh, yeah I, 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 I listen to them all the time and it's still as you said like you can you, you listen to them and it it's funny what you said then about how we're a lot closer to them in our age than than people are now uh, because obviously the the documentary came out by, by Peter Jackson at the end yeah, of last yeah. year and uh, it, it's funny and I've always known this but it kind of actually seeing it in recreated in such color and everything I was I was thinking it's like that that rooftop um, gig was January thirtieth nineteen sixty nine I was born fourteen years later to the day. 
right? Wow, 14 years, uh, only 14 years after it, right? Which is like, you think that was the 1960s and I was born 14 years later, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this like, f- this like remarkable time and, it, and, you f- and you, even like when you think about it, when I think about it now, you're like, wow, the Beatles, like this year is the 60th anniversary of, of Love Me Do. Yeah. Right? Um, but then like, I was born 14 years after the last live appearance. <laughs> so, uh, where were we? So you were saying about being born. Yeah, that, that was it really. It's just this, that, that passage of, that passage of time. It's just like, um, it seems like a lot longer, a lot longer ago, but as you said, like we were a lot closer to it. to like people like that are around now, you know what I mean? Like 60 years, you think, well, that's such a long time, but that's the, that's the remarkable thing about the Beatles was that everything that they did, everything that you can listen to today, that was made was recorded in a seven year period yeah it's incredible like just the pro- the just sheer prolific output of that band over yeah. seven years puts literally every other act to shame it's just un absolutely unbelievable and it, and it changed so much as well like there's, there's there's four distinct periods of style of music from the beatles in seven years right and so they started off with the the kind of cover and then finding their own kind of like you know skiffle to kind of pop music i suppose yeah. Um, when that kind of ended around Hard Day's Night, and then you had uh, Help, uh, Beatles for Sale, Help, Rubber Soul, which were kind of like they were developing the sound to be more like Dylan esque, I suppose, like that kind of folk folk rock kind of way. And yeah. then with Revolver, uh, Sergeant Pepper, and Magical Mystery Tour, they went right into that psychedelic kind of era. And then White Album, Abbey Road, and Let It Be was very much like prog rock. It was like four very distinct styles of music yeah. in seven years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Right, I think I want to play one of your picks now. So uh, mm-hmm. you can choose which one you want to play. I'm assuming you've got them in front of you. I actually don't have your picks in front of me. I've just got mine. So I will, uh, I will let you oh. decide what you want to play and I'll let you introduce it. Well, I think well, while we do, I don't have them in front of me, but I remember which ones they are. Uh, and what <laughs> we'll do is them. we'll go with the... Uh, yeah, we'll go with the early ones. We might do it chronicle- chronological order, order. So I have a couple um, that are from A Hard Day's Night, uh, which again, I think is from that early period of Beatles um, stuff is is my fa- is my favourite album. I think it's the, from that from that early period of what they were trying to do, it's the most developed. Um, it's got some really great songs on it. Um, it's great sound. Mostly it's written by Lennon as well. He did nine of the 13 songs on it. Uh, it was very much a, a Lennon album. Um, and there's a couple of songs on there that I'd, that I'd like us to, to, to play. Um, so the first one actually is a McCartney song called Things We Said Today. Um, the reason I love this is because I think it really showcases um, McCartney's supreme bass playing. He, I mean, he's, he's a fantastic musician. Uh, he was probably the best musician in the in the band quite easily. Um, I don't think he's the best songwriter. I think that is Lennon, but like he was brilliant guitarist, brilliant bassist, brilliant drummer. Um, and Things We Said Today is uh, a really reflective song with a really driving bass line. Um, some really, really great key changes in it as well Some and some great, uh, great harmonies, which the Beatles don't get enough credit for. So this is no. Things We Said Today. You've just heard Things We Said Today by the Beatles, and that is one of my guest's picks, David Green, author extraordinaire. So... We want to talk about some more of our favourite songs, I think. And as I said earlier, if you've just tuned in, uh, if you're watching this live on TikTok, then we're going to be picking quite a few Beatles songs because there's just so many. We can't we can't just do three or four each. You'll be doing it a disservice. Even doing eight each is a disservice, to be honest. But you got to stop somewhere. So um, <laughs> yeah, just talk about talk about maybe some more of your favourites, maybe your favourite albums overall as well. Because we'll uh, we'll, we'll try and one. talk a bit before we before we play anymore. But yeah, so if you want yeah, to, that, I know that's it's such very a difficult. tough one. It is, uh, it is. Uh, right, I I kind of it is tough, but I always kind of go with the White Album, mm. um, just because of the the uh, the scope of it is is a uh, is quite incredible. There's so much different kind of sounds in there as well. Yeah, and it's it's a great it's a great reflection of where the Beatles were at the time. It was recorded in in, in a, oh from just after they came back from the their um, retreat in India, so 
right before they went to India, and what this is one of my songs later on is Hey Bulldog. Um, they had to make a uh, video for uh what song was it they were they were, they were releasing obviously they were still big into singles so they were going off to this retreat and they weren't going to be recorded and they weren't playing live anymore so they were like um it was lady madonna they were releasing lady madonna as a single and it was that's not on any albums or anything like that it's and that's what they used to do Cause some of the, the best songs were just b-sides from yeah. a singles release right so um they were shooting a video for lady madonna and instead of just like, but they'd already recorded the song, so they were like, "Well, while we've bothered in recording us, let's just write another song in this, while we're doing it." So they, from scratch, in the period of like three hours before they were about to get this flight to India, wrote and recorded "Hey Bulldog," which is one of the best songs. I think it's a it's a terrific song. It's got great great riff, um, really great uh, great lyrics, really really catchy, really well sung as well. Um, so they just. And it was literally they had no they had nothing at the start of the day, and this song was just created over this period of three hours, right? That's Completely amazing. done, and it was released as a single. So then they went away to India, and that was the end of that psych, psych, psychedelic uh, era. And then when they were in India, like Lennon's uh, marital problems really came to the head. Uh, there was issues then with uh, the direction of the band. Brian Epstein had just died. McCartney was kind of taking more of control and was kind of the de, de facto manager at the time um, because they were they didn't they didn't replace Epstein uh, right away, and he was coming up with a lot of ways to kind of keep them kind of um, moving forward because as we said before that they'd only record started recording in sixty two well they've been they've been together since they were teenagers in fifty eight so they've been together about ten years at this point and from teenagers to men in the early twenties so a lot of them had changed right um, and. Lennon and, and Harrison's musical tastes were a lot closer than than they were to McCartney's at that point. Um, so a lot of this then, when they came back from India, they'd all been like writing music when they were there, a lot of acoustic stuff, which was the shift in music from psych- Psychedelica. And they came back and started recording the White Album. And when you listen to it, it's just such a... I mean, it's a prog rock album now, I think, that if you're going to term it in today's terms... But at the time, it was like it's indescribable because there's so much, there's so many different styles of music on that album, and every single one of them writes something, every single one of them sings something, and there's there's a couple of really bad songs on there, right? There's Obla Di Obla Da, which yeah. is a terrible <laughs> song. Uh, there is Revolution Nine, which is just like to listen to it. It's <clears throat> incredible to listen to because when you think of it, they made this in 1968, and it's all samples off radios, off off just they were just cycling through the radio and just taking snippets of things they were hearing off the radio and putting it in and all this other nonsense and craziness in it. So it's, it's stunning to listen to, but it's not a great song, right? It's, but it's, it's, it's a remarkable achievement, but then there's some amazing songs on it as well. There's happiness is a warm gun. Um, there is while my guitar gently weeps, which is like, again, a song that was in the sixties, which really, uh, really sounds like the music of the seventies to me. Like it's, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, and That's there's one of my favourite Beatles Ringles. songs that as well. Yeah, We're not playing song. it, I don't think, today because again, like We're I said, there's just too many good ones but yeah, 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 one yeah. Of my favourites. Yeah. Uh, there's some great uh, Ringo Starr songs on it as well. Um, don't Pass Me By is was actually Bob Dylan's favourite Beatles song is Don't Pass Me By by uh, Ringo Starr. Uh, it's a great song. Um, there's some great McCartney songs on it as well as some not so great McCartney songs on it. Um, but it's a great album just to listen to and it's a real journey of an album just to kind of just to kind of go through so i'd, I'd always say that is my favorite um the best album is where it's just like quality from start to finish is more difficult to say yeah abbey road would be up there revolver would be up there but i have a real soft spot for rubber soul as well yeah which i think is a really underrated if anything from the beatles can be underrated i think uh that and Hard Day's Night in particular, but Rubber Soul is a very kind of um, really important album in the Beatles discography because it, it really was um, them really kind of changing gears and, and, and looking as what they were going to be for the next few years. Yeah. Well, I think um, we will play another one of your picks now because um, you just mentioned Happiness is a Warm Gun and I believe that was on your, your list of songs to play. And again, that is a was. fantastic song. So... Without further ado, we're going to play Happiness is a Warm Gun.
You've just heard Happiness is a Warm Gun. We're talking about the Beatles today with author David Green. So um, we're talking about our favourite songs currently. There's plenty more to come, so stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to talk about another one of my favourites now, uh, which is Yesterday. So again, Yesterday famously, the, the, the kind of urban legend about it, and I'm sure you can tell me more whether or not this was true, is that it, was, it came to Paul McCartney in a dream. Uh, whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, but I haven't got a lot to say about the song other than I just think it's beautiful. I, I, I think the, the melody, the lyrics, it, it's, to me, it's a, a perfect song. And um, I've, <clears throat> there's been several times in my life where I have written songs in my dreams. It's so weird. And I've, I've had times where the most beautiful music comes to me in a dream and I'll wake up and I'm like almost crying because it was so emotional. But I'm like Paul McCartney, I can never remember it. <laughs> so I, I don't jump out of bed and like start singing into a voice note or anything or pick up my guitar. It's just, I'm just like, shit, that was probably like, I feel like Tenacious D, like tribute. That's probably the greatest song in the world, but I'll, I just can't remember it now. It's really frustrating. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I don't really have much to say about it other than, again, it's one of those songs and there's, there's other ones I'll talk about later that the older I get, the more it means to me and the more, you know, I kind of relate sure. to it. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, it's just, just a wonderful song. Um, are you a fan of that one or not? Yeah, sure, yeah. I think it's, it's again, it's, it's a great song. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a really important song in the Beatles discography as well for a number of reasons. It was the first Beatles song that had none of the other Beatles do anything on it. Yeah. Um it was all McCartney and that actually caused quite a lot of strife between uh the particularly Harrison and Lennon and McCartney where it was uh they at that point everything it, there's there's a, a trick of knowing who wrote which songs it's whoever sings the songs is the person that wrote it right that's apart from a few Harrison ones where Harrison sings where Lennon gave him a song especially early days but um the the reason they went with the Lennon McCartney songwriting thing was because John Lennon at the early days was very adamant that it was the Beatles, it wasn't anyone individually. And uh he kind of viewed yesterday as McCartney kind of breaking ranks a little bit. Right. Okay, um, yeah. Trying to become more of a, a a star than the rest of them. However, it I mean it's a it's a it's an amazing song and 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 to have a full band in it would dilute the song. I think it is just it is one of those songs that has to be played solo. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it and and the the dream thing. Yeah, that's. Uh, it's funny when you look at a lot of things that McCartney says because he's, he's I mean he's in his eighties now, but his memory even over the years uh, isn't great. Let's say it changes quite a lot, but um, it, his hearing it in a dream is is quite, uh, is um, confirmed by a, a number of of people, and it's not the only one actually. He, there was a few times where he would like say that this song came to him in a, uh, "Let It Be" was another one, um, and a few other ones as well where he would like kind of just have this there was a I can't remember the song now which one it is but there was a song that he just had the the melody for and he was like I can't use this because someone else has written this song it's a real it's a song and it was just in the back of his mind and then one day he kind of played it to for the other lads and they were like this no this is this is no one's recorded this song yet right and he was like and it's just been in his head <laughs> And he just stayed away from it for so long because he just thought it was he was ripping someone off. <laughs> but uh, but no, yeah, yesterday it's a great song. Uh, it's great to watch the um, the video of when he sung it live on uh, American TV because you can see how nervous he is as well. It's really quite sweet actually because it's the thing you forget about the Beatles. We're just young lads. Yeah, yeah, like it's insane. Like the just the wisdom and the just the pure emotiveness of their music, all of it, you know, and consi mm -hmm. just considering how young they were at the time. I mean, we're, we're sure. 40 soon, aren't we? Like, you know, we're <laughs> yes, in our, in yeah, our last yeah. year of our 30s and it's like they were young yeah. lads and it's just, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, to even even yeah. even come up with just one song as good as, as a Beatles song, yeah. you know, would have been amazing, like, in my entire it's, life, never mind when you're in your 20s no. or whatever, you know. It's, it's just like... Yeah, it's mad when you think about it, when, when they broke up, like... Uh, Ringo Starr was the oldest at 29 and John Lennon was 29. Harrison was just turned 26, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's crazy, really, when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah, it's a beautiful song. And so we're going to play it now. This is Yesterday. You just heard Yesterday. So we're talking about the Beatles today. Um, right, another another one of your favourites, Dave. If you want to just, just chat for a while, we'll try and break it up. We've got so many songs to play, but we'll try and get some chat in between as well as much as we can. Yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, so you've got another pick for me? 
Yeah, I will, we'll go back in time again while, while you did yesterday. Uh, we'll go back around that era because that was from Help. Uh, so the, the album, that's what we'll go. We'll go back to Hard Day's Night, and uh, this is a real jaunty one uh, that I really, really like. It's called You Can't Do That. Um, it's a it's a Lennon written one. It's a uh, just it's a really really upbeat uh, song with uh, not such upbeat lyrics, which is something mm. that like you know he uh, Lennon was very very good at doing. Uh, it's a song about controlling someone in a relationship, basically, which is a lot of his early songs were about. Um, but it's it's a it's a great song. Um, they sing it really really well in the movie as well. But what I love about this song is the uh, backing vocals from Harrison and McCartney are like next level. Um, and you can tell it's a song that they really, really like to perform as well. You can hear it knowing that when, because you can just hear it when they're playing it on the album. It's just something that they, they love to play. Um, so yeah, this is You Can't Do That. You just heard You Can't Do That by the Beatles, famously written about Will Smith. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Beatles were so good they could see into the future. They could. They saw everything. <laughs> yeah, oh man. Right, we, we've still got loads to talk about here. Um, I'm just trying to think because I want to interject some more, some more, some more hot takes here, as it were. Hot takes. So, yeah, uh, this is part one of a two part podcast, I believe. It might be an epic one, but we'll see. Um, so, I'm just going to talk about another one of my favorites actually we'll do we'll just continue we'll just bang through the favorite songs for now why not um and then later on if you're not familiar with the format of this podcast uh, we're going to do a section i like to call in defense of which is where we talk about a lesser loved um you know work from whoever we're talking about um it doesn't necessarily have to be critically panned or the you know the the, the general public's reception was lukewarm although that i prefer that when it is it can also just be something we don't like but the 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 caveat with that is we have to try and be nice about it as much as we can. Okay, so we'll get onto that later on. Uh, my next pick, let me see. Um, again, I don't really have a huge amount to say about this. I've got more to say about some of the other picks I'm going to talk about later. But In My Life is another one of my favourite Beatles songs. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason I'm picking this after yesterday is just because, again, it's it's one of those songs. It just has this intangible, like, melancholy quality to it. And again, yeah. the older... The older I get, you know, obviously the subject matter of the song, it just means more and it's it's more relevant. Um, and I have, you know, a lot of my own music, well, not necessarily directly influenced by the Beatles. Um, most of my lyrical subject matter, um, when I'm not moaning about how miserable I am that the weather's not nice, I hear my songs, is, uh, <laughs> is kind of a lot of nostalgia and looking back on past events in my life. And I've got a song that I'm going to, put out on my next EP it's not coming out on the album that I'm releasing this month but um it's been previous release released in the past I did it with my old band but it's called A Ghost for Every Road and that is just about when I lived um in my old town and now when I go back uh I I lived yeah I moved house about 20 times when I lived there right. so I've lived in a lot yeah. of different places in that town um and it's just about you know when you go back to your hometown or whatever and you've just got all these memories and wherever you go you know you've got memories of people that have passed on or friends you don't see anymore or old old girlfriends etc um and i wrote that song about 15 years ago now and um right but just to me that gets more relevant the older i get that song because obviously there's more experiences and there's more you know and, and you know the the further i get away from those experiences you know the more of an objective lens you can have looking back. Um, mm-hmm. So while not necessarily exactly the same subject matter, again, um, you know, I find this a very reflective song. Um, yeah. And I just think it's beautiful. You got any, got any opinions on this one? Yeah, I think it's one of Lennon's best songs um, just in general. Like it, again, it's, it's from Rubber Soul, which again is that turning point album where there was a lot of more introspective looking at about what had happened to them in the last few years in particular. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it came just shortly after Help, and and when you look at when you study Help, the song itself, and and Lennon has said it himself, is like he was literally needing help because he was just what is happening to me, like you know, yeah. um, and my life is a in my life is a real kind of step from that, uh, where he's kind of not as angry about things, but he's kind of looking at it in terms of like processing what has happened to them. Uh, it's a beautiful song such well so well written and this is the great thing about Lennon as well he is such a great singer he's one of the greatest yeah. rock and roll singers um and he sings this song 
uh, is such flex for someone whose voice is so distinct. It was so flexible. He could do like you know the different types of song on Revolution because there's two different versions of it. There's the kind of chilled back one. There's the rock and roll version. He could do all the fifties kind of stuff, but he could do these real slow emotive ballads like in my life yeah. um, and it's one of his best uh, vocal performances yeah absolutely agreed so without further ado this is in my life so you've just heard in my life this is episode four of the mj reynolds podcast and i have david green with me today a good friend of mine and we're talking about the beatles so this is part one we'll be having part two very very soon so we're going to keep banging through our favorite beatles songs so dave do you want to pick another one yeah, uh, I mentioned it before um, because I think after this one, they're all kind of the later day Beatles ones after this song, I think. Yes, they are. So, um, yeah, this one is Hel- Hey Bulldog. So, yeah, um, yeah it's it's one that they just wrote in and basically quite came up with in about three hours while they were <laughs> making a video for, <laughs> for, for something else. Um, and... Uh, it's just it's just a great song, great riff, um, non nonsensical. It's one of those things where it, there's a Lennon written one, and the lyrics are kind of nonsensical, but also they mean something at the same time, uh, yeah. which he was very very good at doing and kind of hiding the meaning of of some things that he wanted to kind of pointed things that he wanted to get across at certain people. Um, a lot of those being the Rolling Stones, quite a lot around this time <laughs> uh, that he used to do. Um, and uh, it's just a really great song. The riff in it, which you'll hear in a second, is just is just great. It's a real pounding song. You know, everyone's on top on top form. Uh, it was the end of an era as well because you know it, the the music kind of did change a little bit after this after this period. Um, but it's also just as well a testament to like you know if you're really gonna if you if you like the Beatles a little bit or it's something that you want to you want to explore a little bit more. Um, a lot of the best songs aren't ones that are on albums, and this is a great example of it. And there could have been a few different ones you could have chose. Like you know, there's "Rain" is a great one, uh, which is basically the song that Oasis ripped their style from. It's no way, it's an Oasis song from 1965, right? <laughs> it's just it's if you go back and listen to it, um, everything about it sounds like Oasis, but a better version of Oasis from 20, 30 years previous. Um, <laughs> And it's not on any of the albums. It was a B side from uh, from Taxman, I think it was. Uh, it was recorded during Revolver uh, Revolver sessions. Um, but yeah, Hey Bulldog, um, great song, love it. And it's also my son who is four. He loves this song as well because oh, um, he loves dogs. And at the end of the song, they all start howling like dogs, and he thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> so you've just heard Hey Bulldog. There we go. One of my guests' favourite songs. Uh, okay, so moving swiftly on, we've got loads of picks each. Um, I was maybe with this podcast, when we split it into two, going to do the same format twice, but I think we're just literally going to do part one, part two. So this part will cover our favourite songs, and then in part two, you will be hearing more of our kind of lesser-loved works. I'll probably bitch about Paul McCartney's solo career <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but for now, we're just we're going to remain positive we're going to remain energetic we're going to be talking about the rest of our favorite Beatles songs so my next pick is Strawberry Fields Forever Um, and to me it's just again this was one of the first times I heard a really bizarre psychedelic song and this this is a very Mm. prog song Um, there's lots of Mm. changes in the song there's changes to the tempo there's changes to the the feel of it the instrumentation the orchestration um just the melodies, just, it's a very winding, weird song. Um, and I just absolutely had never heard anything like this when I first heard it. This was on uh, the mixtape my dad had as well. Right. Um, and I, th- I don't think I even knew it was the Beatles at the time, but it just always stuck out to me. And um, it's it's weird because there's parts of the song that are really nice and they make me feel really kind of, I don't know, it's, it's an intangible thing, like I said, for me. The Beatles, the emotion I get from listening to the Beatles is quite unlike literally any other band or artist and i can't put an emotion to it it's to me i label it the beatles emotion it's just it's weird i can't i know i'm not being very articulate but i can't explain it any better (laughs) than that and this song has that there's a there's a kind of almost a reassurance when i listen to the beatles that everything's going to be okay but then the thing i like about this song i actually find the bits where he's where 
it takes a bit of a minor turn and these like strawberry fields and nothing is real. It's very sinister almost the way it sounds. Yes, and, yeah. and that then so it, that blanket's kind of pulled out from underneath me, that rug. And I can't mm. explain it any better than that really. But um, again, there's just yeah. so many amazing parts to this song. The, the or- orchestration on it is absolutely fantastic. Um, and also I just want to say it features Mellotron at the beginning, which is one of my all time favorite instruments. Um, I just love the sound of it. There's nothing that sounds quite like a Mellotron. And um, another Beatles documentary series, I mean, it's not really the Beatles that I really love, um, I believe is also on Disney+, Plus, and it's Paul McCartney talking to Rick Rubin, the producer, about the Beatles. And they take all the master tapes and they just, any time any artist can get their hold of their master tapes and just fades out different instruments, brings things up in solo. The yeah, geek yeah, in me, yeah. like the music geek, loves stuff. I live for that shit. Uh, and they did, um, I don't know if it was Strawberry Fields, I can't remember, they did a, one of their songs featuring Mellotron, and it's just such an instrument, interesting instrument, um, because it's mm-hmm. one of the first samplers, really, you know, a Mellotron, you, you press the keys and it plays a tape, and it's a recording, sure. whether it's a, um, a choir of voices, or it could be strings, but it's all, the tape's all warped, obviously, it's really old, um, and I think there's only, it only lasts a certain amount of time before the tape runs out, so you, it's, you know, a very early example of a sampler basically and yeah um if you're if you're not a musician or you're not passionate that much about music and you don't know what mellotron is i i recommend just look at a youtube video just type in mellotron and see what comes up you'll you'll know the sound the minute you hear it because there's absolutely nothing else that sounds like that and um one of my other favorite bands counting crows use mellotron all the time um i've used mellotron in a couple of my songs actually um on my album that you will you will hear coming out soon <laughs> we'll we'll leave shameless plugs till the very end of the podcast but uh, but yeah there's there's nothing quite like it and the mellotron is in the intro of this song i do believe so um i don't think i have much more to say about it um yeah just just an incredible arrangement incredible selection of instruments as well dave any opinions yeah. on this one yeah, um, I think the song that you're on about before what they did on that documentary is, is a fool on the hill. I think because it mm. just that has it in it as well, um, and that was around this time period as well where they were really delving into. Obviously, they stopped touring uh, shortly before this, and they were really delving into studio techniques and really going very very deep into it. Obviously, they pioneered eight track recording, yeah, which wasn't done before, uh, and that let them do a lot more kind of overdubs. Uh, to the point where they actually kind of all felt they suffered as musicians because they never really played together all that much yeah. um, after from this point on it was all you know in the studio kind of work but anyway that's a different discussion but yeah uh strawberry fields um yeah the vibe of it and a few of the songs that they did from this this period is strange uh and it always this one in particular always reminds me of if Lewis Carroll became a musician and wrote a yes. song. This yeah. would be a, this would be Lewis Carroll doing a song. I don't know if that's ever been. Uh, I know Lennon was a big fan of uh, Alice in Wonderland, and I don't know if this that was a direct influence on this song, but I can't see it not being because it's so abstract, and it has that nice kind of on the surface level. Everything is everything is nice, everything is lovely, but then it has that undercurrent of. Uh, uh, it's quite feverish, actually, underneath it, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. I think in my notes I do have Fever Dream written down, actually. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, uh, and that is very Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass. Um, so, yeah, this is this is a great song. And like you say, it's... it's, it's um, just imagine being back in 1967 and hearing this for the first time. You'd be like, yeah. what, what is this? What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go down the rabbit hole right now. This is Strawberry Fields forever. You've just heard Strawberry Fields. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that psychedelic trip. If you've never heard that song before, if you're one of the old these young whippersnappers coming up on TikTok <laughs> these days, <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, that whole kind of prog era of the Beatles and the psychedelia is just, um, like I said, it just gives me this very bizarre, uneasy feeling, but like in a, a great way. I absolutely love it. There's, there's yeah. still nothing like it to this day, you know, and you can hear the influence in so many prog bands. You know, right up to today, even like prog metal bands and stuff, you can hear the influence yeah. in this this kind of stuff. Um, it's just yeah. so ahead of its time, so unbelievably yeah. ahead of its time. Um, right, what do you want to time as well? Carry on, yeah. Well, so yeah, so I, was, I think a lot of the time from from that stuff as well. The, the the more interesting things they were doing was stuff that wasn't on the albums, like 
strawberry fields like I am the walrus which I know you're going to talk about later on yeah um they weren't on the albums because because I have a very kind of I know Sergeant Pepper is seen as like one of the best albums but I, I it leaves me a little bit cold that one because I think there's some great standout tracks on it but I think that I think McCartney's influence of trying to do this it's too micromanaged, I think, in a way as well. Right, yeah. Um the, the the best songs are uh Day in the Life and uh Getting Better and um and ones like that that are kind of more standalone, I suppose, to what yeah. everything else is going on that album. But then a, a lot of the stuff like Strawberry Fields and uh so on that's the went the what they were just doing and experimenting on was stuff that was a lot more interesting for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you've mentioned quite a few times now about songs that aren't on any of the albums. And that's one of my mm-hmm. favourite things is when an artist does that. Um, yeah. One of my favourite bands um, is Dave Matthews Band. And they, <laughs> again, they've, they've been going a long time and they've got lots of albums, but their best songs, again, even so I'm just saying that there are acts even now that do the same kind of thing. Their best songs only get played live. They're not, they're not even been recorded. Um, so right. there's other examples of that I can think of as well. Just so many artists. And it, it's more exciting in a way when that happens, I think. It's like, especially sure. when you're discovering an act for the first time and you hear a song, and you're like, where is this? And then you can't find it on an album. And then you've got to go, you know, down this rabbit hole of trying to, trying to, you know, dig up these songs and thinking, why the hell has this never been recorded? Or why isn't this on, yeah, yeah. you know, an actual album, you know, as a statement of intent. I, I love stuff like that. You know, I think it, I think there's yeah. a lot to be said for one-off songs. And, you know, ironically now we're we're kind of coming back into the age of the single now. The album, I, I wouldn't yeah. say the album is dead. I love albums. But obviously in the digital age, you know, the way to release music for modern artists now is singles. Um, sure. And just having, you know, very standalone tracks. And I think something's been lost in translation with that, which is quite sad. But at the same time, sometimes I just think it's it's really nice to have you know, just that kind of thing, which is why very deliberately I'm again in my own music. I'm about to release my first full length album this month, but I've got another album that I'm going to be hopefully bringing out later in the year. Um, I won't be releasing singles like I did last year. I'm just going to release two albums. Yeah, but yeah. in between that, I've got another four songs that aren't going to be on those albums at right. all. So just for fun, you sure. know, just because like I said, I absolutely love this, this way of releasing yeah. music. I think it's just, I always just think when I look at a song that I love and I realize it's not on an album, I'll be thinking, well, why is it not on the album? What was the what was the intent behind this? What's the reason of having it standalone? And sometimes I guess it's just that it wasn't recorded in time for an album, or sometimes it's you know, it just came came from the ether, the inspiration, and you know, yeah, it's like, let's sure, get it yeah, out sure. there. But um, yeah, I just I just love it. I love anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. I might as well talk about this song then that I was going. Go I was going to leave it till later on, but while we're talking about it, because that is one of these songs. Uh, this one is uh, probably my favourite Beatles song altogether, and it's the Ballad of John and Yoko, um, which is uh, it's a fascinating song how they how they came up with it and everything about it. But it's it's just a superb song, uh, really really funky, great great bass line. It's a really bass driven song. Um, great well sung by john very very kind of witty as well about what had been going on in his life at the time and it wasn't on any of the albums and it's got yeah. it's one of the great all time like obviously in them days they used to release a side and b sides right and they'd both be in the charts and it's got one of the greatest b sides as well which is old brown shoe by harrison which is a, a fantastic song as well uh that could very easily be on, on this list in a different a different time um but yeah the ballad of john and yoko was interesting because they after their rooftop performance doing uh when they were trying to do the let it let it be album which they kind of just shelved basically they all went off on their own separate ways for a little bit um and john and yoko ono went and got off and got married um in uh amsterdam i think it was and this is the song about that and basically they came back after that and uh John was in London, McCartney was in London, uh, Harrison and Starr were off somewhere else and uh, he had this song and he was like, Paul, will you come and help me record this song? And so that this entire song is just John Lennon and Paul McCartney playing everything on it. Uh, I think it's um, McCartney's on bass and drums and, McCart- and Lennon does the guitars and the singing. Uh, and it's funny as well because when you listen to some of the outtakes, uh, they're, they're kind of... <laughs> John's like, uh, can you go a bit faster there, please, Ringo? They all call him Ringo in the in the, in the video, and he's like, yeah, all right, George, when he's doing the solos and all this, right? <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because they just come back off this like tenth time 
of um, of uh, trying to do this live performance, and they had this break, and you can tell when you hear these, and this is a real kind of deep cut for a Beatles fan when you listen to them in the studio. There's a real camaraderie there again, and they're just coming up with a song, and and Paul's it's it's John's song, but Paul's coming up with like maybe we can go do this here, and maybe we can do that there, and they they got a real kind of great relationship doing it, and it's just funny because like. I personally think Ringo was a good drummer and he's, he's good for what the Beatles were in their style of music. But yeah. I don't think there's any doubt that Paul McCartney was a better drummer than Ringo in, in yeah. most ways. And this is very, you can tell the difference between the drumming styles. There's a lot more flashy drumming style uh, in this one. Um, and it's just, it's a great rock song. Uh, and it's one of, it's probably is my favourite Beatles song. Uh, so this is The Ballad of John and Yoko. You've just heard the ballad of John and Yoko, one of my guest David Green's picks for today. Um, do you enjoy Yoko Ono's screaming, <laughs> flailing <laughs> orgasms uh, set to saxophone? Do you enjoy it? Because no, I saw I, that I the other day for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I can't say that I do. Um, I, I know I've listened to all of like the Beatles solo stuff, and obviously there was the plastic Ono band, that uh, mm. which is a weird experience because the, the the John songs on that are really good. And then you have Yoko songs on it as well, which are not very good. And um, <laughs> listen, like you know, I, I think um, I think her uh, influence in breaking up the Beatles has been overstated over the years, Agreed. and I think it's kind yeah. of people people are kind of coming back around to that now. <coughs> in a, sorry, in um, in just how much of a disruptive influence she was or wasn't. I don't think it was any more than uh linda eastman who became linda mccartney was yeah. or anyone else um i think it was just people the, the the reasons for the beatles breakup were myriad and convoluted or convoluted but it was also a lot more straightforward than that as well yeah um i don't think it was any really anything to do with with yoko ono to a great extent and, and then i think when you see the documentary that that uh Peter Jackson did and it's nine hours of footage so you get a quite a good sample size of it no one really cares that she's there <laughs> no I was, I was about she's... to mention that yeah I think it's it's kind of exonerated yeah. her a little bit I think you know watching that yeah yeah and, and you know she's she, obviously she has she was uh you know she was an artist in her own right when she met John Lennon like uh she was um you know she was in the New York art scene she was avant-garde uh and the music reflects that it's not for me um you know, uh, I wouldn't listen to it out of choice yeah. if I really had to or anything, any, or anything like that. Uh, um, but I think it's one of those things where it's like, uh, it's what it's it's. She gets a lot of unwarranted stick. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Okay, so we'll soon wrap up part one. I think of this just for mainly for on this old TikTok live here. I want to make sure this saves properly. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> What we'll do in a, in a little while is um, we'll, we'll stop and then we'll start again if you've got some time. Uh, but for now, we're going to carry on with our favourite songs. Um, so I might as well go on to I Am The Walrus because we already mentioned it. Again, not a huge amount to say. Uh, most of what I can say about this song applies to what I said about Strawberry Fields as well. Um, this is the one actually, it says here in my notes, Walrus, just so bizarre, like being in a fever dream. <laughs> okay, so again, yeah. um, this was one that we did in school as well, uh, weirdly. <laughs> um, right. And I remember yeah. as a kid, always just sniggering in that little boy way when it says about being a naughty girl, letting your knickers down. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, being a kid, I didn't even understand really what he was talking about, but <laughs> it's <No>. just funny. <laughs> so me and my mates just be like, elbowing each other in the ribs going because she's letting her come down sure, yeah, which is brilliant yeah, yeah. <laughs> but again just um, girl. yeah I think this is also I would say probably my first exposure really to rock music certainly mm. um, certainly on a, a kind of chronological timeline of you know music history I might have listened to some say um, like I mentioned earlier there were things like Guns N' Roses um, on this mixtape my dad had which is obviously more kind of you know 80s hard rock but um probably the earliest example i'd say this and something like ziggy stardust the song from bowie um with overdriven guitars and obviously anything by hendrix um yeah. but yeah this is the first time really it's got that kind of swagger to it this song you know obviously the lyrics yeah. are just absolute nonsense but it's um again this is you can hear the the oasis 
influence you yes. know, from this song on on their more kind yeah. of rock songs even stuff like you know morning glory the song and things like that um they yeah. might not be psychedelic but it's just something about the aggression of it it's not it's not even aggressive but sure. it is very it's got this awesome like swagger to it and yeah it's it's just one of the first rock songs i ever heard and, yeah. and kind of got me into rock music way before i even knew what rock music was so uh, yeah what do you what do you think about this song no yeah i I love it i think it's a great song uh i I think the thing that oasis really kind of took and it's the same with the song rain that i I mentioned before which has again a kind of similar kind of riff to this this is a lot heavier than than rain because it's a few years later but lennon sings it with a real sneer yeah which obviously gallagher really really kind of copied uh uh and maybe perfected on maybe one of the albums, like you know. Uh, but um, you, uh, Liam's a great singer, really, for that kind of music. You can't really deny that. Uh, oh, Morning but, Glory um, itself yeah. is my favourite Oasis song. It's fucking brilliant. I absolutely love it. Yeah, but this this song has that that's real sneer that he's singing it with, and um, yeah, it's a great song. It's, it's absolutely bizarre. Uh, there's that urban myth about how Lennon wrote this one because he heard that people were studying his lyrics in English classes. Uh, so he wrote this song. I'm not sure if that's actually particularly true or not. Uh, I've heard conflicting things about it, um, but I'd like to think it is true. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I like uh, I Am The Walrus. And also it's one of, I've heard Oasis cover this song a few times live and they actually do quite a good job of it as well. Not, not surprisingly, do, yeah. really. Not surprisingly. Yeah, yeah no, they, they, were, they were built to play this song really, weren't they? Let's be honest. <laughs> Yeah. So without yeah. further ado, here is I Am the Walrus. Goo 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 you. <laughs> you have just heard I Am the Walrus. So that was one of my picks. Uh, we're going to just bash through our last few. I think I've got three songs left on my list. So we'll uh, we'll keep the talking a little bit to a minimum and then we'll end this part of the podcast and you can hear part two very soon. So what's your next pick? How many you got left, do you think? I've lost track completely. Three, three, three left, three. yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I'm about to... This is the last one of, one of, the, of the initial list that I sent through. So uh, <laughs> this one is off the White Album and it's a, it's a great one because one of the great things about the White Album was that he went back to basics on a lot of the songs. Uh, where they tried to limit, uh, not as much as they tried to do for Let It Be, um, which kind of went out the window, where they tried to do less overdubbing and tried to do more live performances. And this is the one of the ones where they did just do it as a band, and it's called Your Blues, or Yeah Blues. Yeah, blues. Uh, and this is a, it's a great song. Again, terrific riff, uh, really well sung by John Lennon. Uh, and it's uh, it's a great story behind it. It's only a brief one, thankfully. It's, um, basically, it was 1968, and so there was a lot of people like Clapton around, and Led Zeppelin had just come around as well, all doing this kind of like white white English man take on blue mu- blues music. Uh, so John Lennon thought he would do his own version as a uh, s- uh, gently poking fun at these people. Uh, trying to be thinking that they were blues musicians and just did the best version of a in- white English man's blues song that there probably is. Your so blues. Is your blues. <laughs> you just heard Your Blues by the Beatles. Okay, moving swiftly on. My next pick is Michelle, which is, I don't think it's necessarily one of the. Um, My bell. It's not necessarily one of the, the Beatles songs you immediately think of when you think of the Beatles, I don't think. But. Um, I just love this song. I think it's a very sweet song. Um, and one of my earliest crushes in my life when I was about 11 or 12 years old was a girl called Michelle and I always used to think of this song. <laughs> I, I thought <laughs> you were going to say Paul McCartney. I well, thought you were going to say Paul McCartney. Yeah. One of the earliest crushes was Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, she was she was one of my first, not my first, but one of my first proper crushes when I was on the cusp of manhood. Make of that what you will. <laughs> um, and and what I find funny about this song is um, she was everyone used to mispronounce her name and call her Michelle instead of Michelle right. and I love yeah. that this song is Michelle my bell so yes. it, always, it always makes me chuckle uh, when I think of it um, I don't think I ever sung it to her um, uh, I would have pissed her off far too much to do that but uh, yeah. yeah no yeah. nothing ever came of that I was too shy I think she was into me as well but uh, I was too shy to ever ever ask her out it's the story of my life that is that's the way, isn't <laughs> so it? yeah I just I just think it's a lovely song um, again I really like the acoustic guitar in this song it's it's really nice um, and I think I might even learn this song to play because it's just just a lovely song um, what do you think yeah I think it's a nice song um, it's unusual for for the Beatles catalogue as well, it's a very 
uh, unique song, I suppose. Um, I, it's, it's almost a, a prelude to yesterday, and uh, which is funny because I think McCartney then also tried to chase yesterday a few times afterwards, yeah. like Blackbird and, and a few other things. Um, so this is kind of like the lead up to that, and it's a nice song. It, it's funny enough. It, I mean, it's not. I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites or anything, but it's one that yeah. I often find myself humming just randomly because it's just got that nice melody to it yeah yeah it's beautiful right so this is michelle not michelle you've just heard michelle or michelle whichever way you want to uh to say it dave what's your next one let's let's bang on with these so i was mistaken before when i said that, that was the end of my original list because the other the, the other one of my songs which i sometimes say is my favorite uh if i it changes on a daily basis it's either one of these two songs and it is uh, from uh, Let It... The, the last, Funny enough, the last two songs are going to be from Let It Be, actually. Um, kind Which of. Which we're going to talk this about wasn't later. The, yeah, this, this, so this one wasn't originally on the uh, the Warren Spector version of Let It Be because it was released as a uh, single. But um, if you have seen the rooftop uh, performance, it's one that they do a couple of times, and it is Don't Let Me Down which um, I think is uh, a very simple uh, song lyrically wise, it, but it's very, very uh, emotive and very primal. Um, and it was basically John writing at that time about he has thrown himself in with Yoko Ono. Basically they've been married. He's left his wife for her, who he was, he, had, he married because she was pregnant, which he was very upfront about at the time and had to hide the fact that they were married at the start of the Beatles as well, which is just bizarre when you think about it. Uh, and the Simpsons obviously did a great version of that with the with the B sh- with the B sharps. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But th- this was basically him being very very vulnerable and just saying like you know don't let don't let me down, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's a beautiful song though. It's a, it's a really well sung between the whole group. Uh, back in vocals by McCartney is great superb um lead guitar by george harrison on it as well uh he even does this like nice little kind of japanese inspired twang to the to the to, to, to some of the bridges which is yeah. really adds to the song um and billy preston who the ringo uh, george harrison had drafted in to help out with the uh let it be sessions or as they were called get back at the time really adds to this song like a lot of these songs with his keyboard playing which was a, a really unique flavor so this is this is yeah if you ask me tomorrow i'd say this is my favorite beatles song but today it's ballad of john and yoko but tomorrow yeah. it could well be don't let it don't let me down great raw emotive vocal performance as well on this song just mm. just really really great you can just hear it in his voice so this is don't let me down You've just heard Don't Let Me Down. We're coming towards the end of our favourite songs picks from the Beatles today. Uh, my next one, again, uh, another one of the prog ones, another descent into the fever dream of Lewis Carroll, one might say, which is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Uh, maybe an mm. obvious pick for a song. It's not anything to do with the um, the kind of psychedelic imagery in this song, the lyrical content. Um, the pure one and only reason I'm picking this song, as much as it is one of my favourite Beatles songs, is... The opening guitar lick, the intro. Um, it's one of my favourite guitar intros of all time. Um, and if anyone here follows uh, Rick Beato, the producer, he's got a YouTube channel. He's probably the, the foremost authority on music, I would say, these days. Uh, he's, his channel on YouTube is absolutely worth subscribing to if you're interested in music at all. Um, and he often does rundowns of, say, the top 20 intros of all time to songs, things like that. And this was one of them. Um, that is literally all I have to say about it. I just absolutely... Still to this day, don't think there is anything like the intro to this song. And again, it's just a song that takes you on a journey, has very, very distinct sections to it. Uh, so, mm. Dave, your thoughts? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a great song. It's iconic, isn't it, really? And it's what it is like, you know, it, it, you have to really say that about a lot of Beatles songs, that it's yeah. iconic. And this one... This one really is, and it's great as well. There's, a, there's a obviously everyone thinks it's about LSD, uh, but John Lennon says that it isn't. It was about yeah. uh, Julian drawing a picture of a girl with stars around her, yeah. and the stars were like diamonds. And it's like so, it's a song about his son, uh, which is 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 nice because they obviously didn't have the uh, the greatest of relationships. I think it's yeah. fair to say, and I think uh, uh, um, John Lennon obviously said that himself. Uh, so yeah, it's um, but again, it has that real odd, unsettling vibe to it as well. Yeah. So this is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. 
You've just heard Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I've only got one more pick after this one. Uh, Dave, do you want to take it away with your next one? Yes, yeah, so this is my last one as well. Um, so this one is... There's two versions of this song, and this one I... Uh, if you're talking about best Beatles songs, you have to have... Well, I know you haven't, but at least one of us have. We have to put a George Harrison song into the mix, uh, especially towards the end of the Beatles, because he became he was becoming into a real uh, great songwriter that didn't last a very long amount of time, funnily enough, because his uh, solo stuff really kind of tailed off after a couple of really great albums, which you can say about all of the Beatles solo stuff, actually. Um, but he obviously had a great run, and the obvious one is something from Abbey Road and there's also Here Comes the Sun uh, yeah. While My Guitar Gently Weeps um, and then on Let It Be there is um, uh, two two great songs that he, that he wrote there one of them for some reason is just completely escaped my mind but it's called oh it's actually called For You Blue uh, which is a really nice song about his, his wife uh, but the one that I've chosen is I Me Mine. I Me Mine. So there's two versions of this song. It's on both versions of Let It Be. And the uh, original version, Warren Spector puts in this weird orchestra thing that is this, the wall of sound thing that he was famous for. And it kind of ruins the song. It takes away from it. In the Let It Be Naked version, it's as it was intended. And it's uh, it's almost like a Spanish waltz with a really hard rocking chorus in it. And it's, uh, it's a song about... Um, Harrison's frustrations with McCartney and Lennon at the time in terms of like how he was having to fight for uh, getting any songs recorded and the practice properly. Um, and it's funny enough, like on, on All Things Should Pass, his first album, which was a, which was a double album and it's fantastic, actually it's a triple album, um, most of the songs were ones that were rejected by Lennon and McCartney for to be Beatles songs. <laughs> Because they were like these, because a lot of them were better than the songs that they were producing at the time. Um, but this was one, probably one of his lesser ones of that period. But I really like it because I just think it's got a really great chorus. It's really well sung by Harrison, which was a change for him because he's not the best of singers, but he really kind of developed his voice. Um, and uh, yeah, I really enjoy that it got uh, a second go out of it on Let It Be Naked because it deserved it. So this is yeah. I, Me, Mine. You just heard I, Me, Mine by The Beatles, written by George Harrison. So we have one more song to play you, and then that is going to be it for part one of this podcast. The Beatles are such a big, important band that I thought we needed to do a good, a good long, uh, long podcast for this one. So we'll split it into two. My last pick is She's Leaving Home. And my main reason for picking this, I mentioned earlier about, you know, one of the songs maybe being one of my first experiences as a child of actually paying attention to lyrics in a song. Um, this is certainly another one where ne not, I didn't necessarily obviously relate to it as a child or anything, but the imagery is so striking in it and it just tells a story. And so it, it, it's a song where to me, the lyrics really grab your attention and demand your attention. Um, and so not being a songwriter myself until many, many years later, this is probably one of my earliest exposures to something very melancholic, um, you know, very beautiful song, very sad song. Um, I, again, just absolutely love the, the melodies. The orchestral arrangement in this song with the strings is absolutely wonderful. Um, and yeah, to this day, it's one of my favourite Beatles songs. And that's, that's about all I have to say on it. What do you reckon, Dave? That's all I got to say about that. Um, <laughs> as Forrest Gump would say. Uh, no, yeah, I, I like the song as well. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, I think it was, I think he, this is an unusual one because I think he actually, it's one of the f few McCartney songs where he actually tells a story in a song. Yeah. Like, and he started, he started doing that a little bit later on. Um, but they all kind of felt a lot, not as genuine as this song, like this yeah. one, I think. Uh, and it was, um, uh, it was inspired by something he read in the Daily Mail about teenage runaways which was kind of happening quite a lot around this time in England and uh, and um, yeah it's, it's it's a very like beautiful song um, and uh, there's a lot of really nice backing vocals in this song as well very very yeah, sweeping yeah. and very haunting um, yeah it's a really nice song and, and it's it really stands out on, on, on uh, Sergeant Pepper for me because a lot of that a lot of that album is so bombastic 
Yes, yeah. In many, many different kind of ways and very like avant garde. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, right before this song is fixed in a hole and after it is yeah. being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, which, you know, is yeah. the very, very different songs. So it really kind of stands out as, a, as something that's unusual and could have been on a different album, I suppose. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been out of place on, you know, Revolver. It wouldn't have been out of, out of place on the White Album. Um, so yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, I kind of feel as well. It's almost um, kind of the twin song of Eleanor Rigby, just in terms of it tells a story and that very yeah. baroque kind of orchestration to it as well. Um, so just yeah. in in that way, I think that thematically they kind of feel very similar. They very have very kind of bittersweet lyrics, um, and again, sure. just amazing orchestral arrangements. So this is my final pick. This is "She's Leaving Home." You've just heard "She's Leaving Home." That is the last of our favourite Beatles songs that we're going to talk about today. And also we're going to end part one of the Beatles here. So please do stay tuned. You'll be hearing part two very soon where we will be talking about some of our lesser loved Beatles work. We'll be talking about what we're both up to now and there'll be plenty more. So thanks for joining me, Dave, for part one. No worries. Thank you for having me. No worries. And uh, yeah, so shall we... We're going to go out, I think, with maybe another song um is there anything not on your list you'd like to pick it doesn't have to be a favorite but i like to leave each part with a piece of music so anything at all i you know i think you know while it's, we're getting into the summer and i know that you love the sun i think we should do here comes the sun yes which would have actually been one of my picks if i could have more <laughs> more songs you know that and the long and winding road funny enough and um while my guitar gently weeps so those would have been my other three so yeah here we go. Hopefully, it's absolutely been pissing down here, but uh, I don't know what it's like where you are at the minute in uh, good old Ireland. Is it a typical Irish weather at the minute? It is a torrential rainpour at the moment, yeah. <laughs> so we need we need this song. We need it. Yes. <laughs> so here we go. So we'll see you next time for part two. And this is Here Comes the Sun. <laughs> 